Welcome, everyone. We're going to get the program started right at seven, but if I we're we're expecting a full house, so if I can ask if there's any seats in the middle that people from the outer sides kind of move into the middle, so people have access to those seats, that would be amazing. And thank you so much for your help with that. We want to make sure all the seats are filled before we push people into the overflow seating. Also, if you're going to have a question, we will have a Q and A section at the end. Uh, there's some cards and pens in a basket right next to the back door and a little red bucket. If you wanna grab a card, write down your question and put it in the red bucket. We're gonna to get to as many of them as we can, but it will be a limited time. So we ask that you do that before the program starts and then we'll get to them uh, as many as, them as we can. Thank you so much.
Welcome everyone. We're going to be starting in just a couple minutes, but just a reminder, there is overflow seating in the lobby if you would like to sit out there and watch the program. Um, it is a full house. It's great to see you all. Uh, and if you do have a question, there is, uh, there's going to be Q&A at the end, and there's a basket of, of cards for questions and pens in the very back there. And there's a little red bucket. You can put that question in and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Thank you so much. I think we're at seven o'clock right now. So we'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. I am Brooke Clement. I am the director here at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum. 
which is part of the National Archives and Records Administration. And it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight for this terrific guest that we've got here. Um, I wanna thank you and for your commitment to the Library and Museum and also thanks to Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation for its continued support of programs such as this. Um, I'm gonna quickly mention a couple of our upcoming programs. Next Thursday, we are hosting a virtual panel discussion on how a president should be with Michael Abramowitz, Alexis Coe, Aaron Haynes, and Luke Nichter. And then on April 23rd, Peter Baker is gonna be at the museum discussing journalism and, vice, and the vice presidency. And then on April 26th, we are partnering with the First Ladies Association for Research and Education on a First Ladies Conference at the museum. So we hope that you can at least join us virtually, if not in person. Now, I have the great honor of introducing our guest this evening. Barbara McQuaid is a professor from practice at the University of Michigan Law School. She is also a legal analyst for NBC News and MSNBC and a co-host of the podcast, podcast Hashtag Sisters in Law. From 2010 to 2017, she served as U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan. Appointed to this role by President Obama, she was the first woman to serve in her position. Earlier in her career, she worked as a sports writer, a copy editor, a judicial law clerk, an associate in private practice, and an assistant, an assistant to U.S. attorney. Welcome to the night, Barbara. <laughs> We're so happy to have you. Well, Brooke, thank you so much. I am so honored to be here. One of my first uh, memories as a child was seeing Gerald Ford replace Richard Nixon as the president. So it's a very meaningful space for me. So thank you. And thank you for that warm applause after that very enthusiastic murmur for Peter Baker. I was feeling a little jealous, but, <laughs> but thank you. And uh, I'm really thrilled to be here tonight. Thank you all so much for coming out. I knew we, we were competing with beautiful weather and I thought, what if nobody comes? It's so nice out. Not so you're happening. very nice to come out and I'm honored <laughs> that you're here. And thank you so much, Brooke, for having me. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for agreeing to be here tonight. And um, for those of you who don't know, she'll also be at the museum on June 3rd. So <laughs> we're real excited about that. <laughs> Um, all right, well, you have a new book called Attack From Within, and I would just love to hear from you. Can you tell us uh, about your background that made, that might be relevant to writing this book then? Yeah, um, so, you know, I spent most of my career as a prosecutor, and more particularly as a national security prosecutor. Um, and then when I came to the law school after some bad things happened, folks, in late 2016 that forced me to leave my job at the U.S. Attorney's Office. Too soon, too soon. So I left that job at the end of the Obama administration and was fortunate enough to start working at the law school. And one of the courses I teach is national security. And starting in about 2018, um, I really saw the threat evolve from some of the work I had done with you know, Al-Qaeda and then ISIS um, into this area of foreign disinformation. And so I started assigning to my students um, the Mueller report. Um, and I think most of us, when we hear the Mueller report, we think about what it either did or did not conclude about Donald Trump. But of course, the Mueller report is mostly about Russia and Russian disinformation. So I've been assigning that to my students and every year teaching a little more and more about this topic of, of disinformation and reading a lot about it and learning a lot about it. And I found it just fascinating the way Russia used disinformation, deception, to influence the outcome of our election and to sow division in society. And I, I believe that we are now at a point where disinformation is the greatest threat to our national security. And it isn't coming as much from Russia. I mean, it's still coming from Russia and China and other places, but it's also coming from within our own country, You know, hence the name, Attack From Within. I wanted to call it the calls coming from inside the house. They wouldn't let me. They've already used that in all the horror movies. Like, all right, all right. But that's the idea you know, behind the book is we are now hearing our, our own Americans using these false narratives to influence us. And sometimes it's outright lies, like a stolen election, but other times it's just the use of words, which is why I call it 
disinformation and not necessarily just lies. Some of it's lies, but it's also things like Donald Trump referring to the January 6th defendants as hostages, right? I mean, what does that do to people like hostages? That just like puts a little idea in your head that they are somehow political prisoners. And so it just advances that narrative. So um, what I really wanted to do with this book is to write a book that's accessible for you know, everybody um, so that people can see the disinformation tactics that I have been seeing in my work, um, because I think if we can uh, identify them and name them, we can defeat them. Okay, well, can you, can you go over some of those tactics with us? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just mention a few of them, but you know, one of the tactics that um, has been used throughout history, and so many of these are tactics that we have seen for decades, if not centuries, um, and although you know the method of spreading disinformation has reached epidemic proportions, I think because of social media and the ability to use the internet to get it out there, the tactics are really the same tactics we have seen throughout history. And so one of them uh, used by Hitler uh, is declinism, this idea that everything is bad. Our once great nation is in a terrible place, a nation in ruins. American carnage. Um, this is what you know a, a tactic Hitler used after World War I. The economy is terrible. We have been shamed on the world stage. Everything is bad. And then finding demon and scapegoats that you can point to to blame all this on. Of course, for Hitler, it was the Jewish people. This is all part of a global plot to take over our economy. Um, and in today's age, I think what we hear from disinformers are its immigrants, and I'm going to call them animals and vermin, and they're poisoning the blood. Um, I'll look to people of color, uh, the LGBTQ community who are grooming your children for pedophilia. You know, these are those other people that have caused our country to be in ruin. So that idea of uh, a declining country, because you know what you need when you need a declining country? You need extraordinary means to fix it. The ends justify the means if you are desperate enough. And so, you know, just as Hitler talked about and did suspend the constitution, even Donald Trump said, we need to terminate the constitution when an election is stolen as it has been. Uh, you know, it cause, calls for drastic measures um, and only, only he who can fix it. So this idea of declinism is certainly one of these tactics we've seen throughout history. Um, another is something that debaters refer to as the either or fallacy. The idea that there are only two sides to every issue. There's no room for nuance. There's no room for compromise. What we demand is political purity. My opponent is all bad. They are the devil. They are terrible. They are radical leftists, communists, whatever is you dislike the most, they're that. Then they're all on the other side. Um, and to portray that other side as so awful that the only tenable choice is my side. And my side will embrace symbols of patriotism. We will embrace the flag. We will embrace tradition. We will embrace religion. My side's the good side. And that other side's the bad side. And there's no room for compromise anywhere in between. Another is the whole part fallacy, right? And so I can find one little bit about my opponent that I'll, that I'll mention, and then I will claim that the whole group shares those characteristics. So, you know, in, in uh, the 2020 election, there were certainly some members of the Democratic Party who favored defunding the police. Um, but the, the argument was the Democrats want to defund the police. Joe Biden wants to defund the police. I'm mean, not true. Now, but it resonates with people like, I've heard that, I have heard those, some Democrats say they wanna defund the police. And so we refer to that as the whole part fallacy, right? I take, I take something that's true about part of that group and I attribute it to the whole group. Um, and then, you know, finally, the last one I'll talk about is um, repetition. And this is something that Hitler wrote about in Mein Kampf. He talked about how if you have a simple narrative, especially if you've got a catchy slogan and you say it over and over again and people hear it enough, they will begin to believe it to be true. I mean, we see it in advertising all the time, right? Got milk, uh, just do it, where's the beef? <laughs> all of those 
all of those slogans are playing on those same cognitive forces that cause us to, you know, remember snappy lines. Um, but one of the things Hitler wrote about is um, not only if it's a quick slogan, you know, we've heard these today with stop the steel, drain the swamp, lock her up, whatever those things are, hear them again and again. He also said that ironically enough, the bigger the lie, the more likely it is to be believed. And I'm sure some of you, I mean, it's why they call the lie about the 2020 election being stolen, the big lie, uh, because what Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf is that um, ironically enough, most of us cannot imagine having the audacity to lie about something of great significance. We might lie about little things, right? We might say, um, uh, maybe my husband will say to me, uh, no, that dress doesn't make you look fat, dear. <laughs> but we tell those, those white lies out of kindness or courtesy, right? We all do that. But nobody has the audacity to lie about things of great significance. And we project onto others that same moral compass. And so that's why you can actually get away with things if you're willing to make the most outrageous bold lies ever. You know, for Hitler, again, it's Jews are the source of all evil in our society. And for Trump is they stole the election. Um, zero evidence whatsoever. And I, I read this morning that something like 70% of Republicans surveyed said they believe the 2020 election um, was, was won by fraud. I mean, it's just shocking. There is zero evidence. There were 62 lawsuits filed. Trump lost 61 of them. The one he won was not based in any way on the outcome. It was about an affidavit, a procedural thing. Um, all the audits, all of them confirmed that Joe Biden won. And yet just by saying it enough times, people believe it to be true. So those are some tactics. There are others, but I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Well, um, can you tell us then how technology is contributing to the problem of disinformation? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, technology is a great thing. Um, hello out there in Zoom land. I mean, there are people watching us tonight through technology. It's a wonderful thing that can bring people together, but it also brings with it this capacity to amplify disinformation. So never before have people been able to reach millions of people around the world at the press of a button and to do so anonymously. This is one of the things that is so fascinating to me about the Mueller report is the way that the Russian internet research agency was able to uh, establish accounts on social media that looked like real Americans and thereby sow division and influence the outcome of the election. So that many, many months before the election, they uh, created accounts online that looked like very ordinary American political activists. There was one called Blacktivist, looked like a black political activist, said lots of interesting, smart things. Lots of people started following them. United Muslims of America, same thing, but for Muslims. Um, Tennessee GOP, you know, Republicans in Tennessee, heart of Texas, there were Christian groups, and they all said all kinds of things, but demonstrated an affinity for this group and they attracted lots and lots of followers. Well, then as the election approached, they would say things like, for example, Blacktivist would say, um, you know, Hillary Clinton has never done anything for our community. Let's send her a message by staying home on election day and let her know we will not be taken for granted. Now, you know, this is coming from some Russian guy in a hoodie sitting in a boiler room in St. Petersburg, Russia somewhere. But it looks like to all of the people who've been following Blacktivist for months and months and months, like, huh, Blacktivist said something really interesting today. We'll never know how many people might have heeded that call or from all these other groups heeded similar calls. But if even a small percentage of people did in swing states that were decided by a narrow margin, it could really have a, an influence. And we're seeing it again, we're seeing it with Russians. Um, some of the things we're seeing now um, relates to what's happening in Ukraine. Um, we are seeing um, things about um, Taylor Swift, <laughs> AI-generated porn with Taylor Swift's face, um, all kinds of things. And I really worry about th this election, um, all of the techniques that will be used to create confusion about the election. So 
you know, one of the ways that I'm worried about technology and artificial intelligence being used is maybe some of you heard about the robocalls in New Hampshire that were sent out replicating the voice of Joe Biden, sounded just like him. I, I've listened to the calls, like, you know, malar references to malarkey and everything, sound just like Joe, um, urging voters to stay home um, from the primary and save your vote for the fall, for the general election. I don't know why you have to save your vote, but it sounded pretty good. And, you know, it was an inconsequential primary uncontested. So, uh, but it, it struck me as maybe a dry run, right? A practice to see how well this works. And um, it sounded pretty good. And so again, you got a close election in a swing state and people hear that on their phone, you know, it, on, on Tuesday night, by the time they realize it was a trick, it's Wednesday and it's too late to cast their vote. So I really worry about election suppression and election confusion deliberately put out there through technology. I thought it was interesting in your book that you actually uh, out yourself as a victim of disinformation. You want to go into that a little bit? Oh, don't make me confess. <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, I actually delineate between what I call disinformation and misinformation. So disinformation, uh, as I define it in the book, and a lot of people use them interchangeably and, and they, they can be, but I wanted to distinguish between these two things because I talk about them in two different ways. And so one is disinformation, which is the deliberate use of lies and deception to manipulate people and deceive people. Misinformation is kind of its unwitting cousin. And so when someone innocently reads something, believes it to be true, and then passes it on to others. And so I will confess to misinformation, <laughs> not disinformation, but you know, I'm a big sports fan. And I read um, one day that Patrick Mahomes, the NFL superstar quarterback, had announced that he would not play another down for the Kansas City Chiefs until they changed their name to something that was inoffensive to Native Americans. And I thought, wow, good for you, Patrick Mahomes. And so I retweeted that because I, I got to get that out, right? right? I got to make sure people know about this. And then like several hours later, I'm talking to my husband and my son and said, did you guys see that story about Patrick Mahomes? Like, how about that? And they said, what story? What are you talking about? <laughs> well, what do you mean? You know, the story about not playing another down, you know? And they said, I haven't heard anything about that. And that concerned me a little bit because I thought, hmm, seems like that would have been out there. So I, I'm sure it was legit. I mean, I read it on, on Twitter. <laughs> I said, well, let me find the account. It was, it was pretty good. I mean, I, and I look and I find it and I'm like, look, here it is, ESPN, that's legit, right? And the account is Sprott's Center. Oh, not, not sports center, but so I didn't read carefully. I probably didn't have my reading glasses on. I didn't catch that it was misspelled. So I really, it was a fake and I had fallen for it. So I immediately took down my own tweet, but it, it was a good example for me to see how easy it is to get caught, especially when it's something that, you know, you find a little bit exciting. It is, uh, has like an emotional appeal to you. You hit, you know, you, 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 you get interested in sharing that news with other people. And um, it, it is all too handy for us to be spreaders of misinformation uh, because we have this valuable and potent tool at our fingertips. Absolutely. So with that in mind, you say that some of America's best virtues are also our worst vulnerabilities. What about American democracy makes us particularly just susceptible to disinformation and yeah. misinformation. You know, we have um, so many virtues like our free and open society and our diversity and our commitment to free speech. But some of those very things are the things that um, opponents of democracy seize upon uh, and exploit our freedoms. So, you know, for example, um, our cherished right to free speech. So I bet everybody in this room thinks free speech is incredibly important to society, as do I. People on the left and on the right care deeply about free speech. But it seems to me that recently we are hearing the word censorship used as a weapon. I mean, anything that somebody doesn't like that has any kind of um, tie whatsoever to disinformation is accused of censorship. You know, Donald Trump with these gag orders or uh, he filed a motion to dismiss some of his cases 
on the basis that it's violating my First Amendment rights. They're trying to censor me. Well, like all other rights, our right to free speech may be limited when limitation is narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling governmental interest, right? It's the reason you can't yell fire in a crowded theater or in a crowded Gerald Ford Library <laughs> Auditorium. Um, it's why we can criminalize threats. If you threaten to kill somebody, yes, you are exercising your First Amendment right, but you also can go to jail for doing that. You know, fraud, fraud is typically communicated verbally. You know, would you like to buy some swamp land in Florida? It can get you a great deal. Um, but these are narrow limits on our free speech rights because they advance compelling governmental interests. So, um, you know, the Biden administration had the, at the Department of Homeland Security for 11 days, they set up an agency that was trying to look at disinformation coming in from overseas. And immediately um, Republicans in the Senate accused them of censorship, that you're trying to censor free speech. And so they had to shut down. And the executive director of that uh, agency, Nina Jankowitz, got death threats. And uh, so she resigned. And so, and so it's gone. Um, you know, Elon Musk, when he bought Twitter, kind of got rid of a lot of the content moderation that had previously existed there because he's a big advocate for free speech and says, let's go, let, let, let's let people say what they want to say. I will tell you, as a, as a user of Twitter X, I have seen a huge ramp up in the nasty grams that I get because, uh, and I get accused of censorship and other things because I've written a book about disinformation. But, you know, Elon Musk likes to say that social media is the new town square. And it's just like giving a speech in the town square. We can't inhibit anybody from what they say, but it's not. There are differences, right? In the town square, you can see who's speaking. Online, you can use uh, an anonymous account. You know, you might call yourself Patriot Girl, and nobody knows that I'm, you know, a Russian sitting in a boiler room. Um, in the town square, um, we can see whether their message is popular. Are people cheering for the speaker? Are people booing the speaker? Are they ignoring the speaker? Whereas online, you can use these bots, right? These AI generated accounts to like and share your message to make it look like it's far more popular than it really is. And so any effort to regulate social media gets pushed back as censorship. You know, you're trying to censor uh, right wing voices online. And so it's really tricky. It's what makes it very challenging to make meaningful regulation in social media. I think we can do it. We can talk about that a little bit later, but uh, it's genuinely hard, right? Because we do so cherish our First Amendment rights to free speech, and we don't ever want to do anything that would compromise that. So it makes it very challenging for us to come up with real solutions um, against those who will exploit those freedoms. Right. Um, so you also discuss ways in your book how disinformation is harming public safety and national security. And can you go into more detail about that? Yeah, um, well, you know, when you've got um, a former president saying things like the FBI is a disgrace and falsely accusing them of planting evidence uh, at his Mar-a-Lago home, people are going to get angry. Um, of course, consistency is not um, a, a part of the recipe, right? Because on one day, it's the FBI planted those documents in my home. And then the, on the other, it's, I had every right to take those documents from the National Archives. I think we've got some people here who'd like a word about that, that a, a National Archives facility. Um, when, you know, we hear that uh, the Department of Justice is called the Department of Injustice, or judges are undermined as engaging in election interference. Um, it, it understandably causes somebody out there to hear that um, and react to it and, as a call to action. And so, um, you know, like the judges who've been presiding against some, in some of these cases, Judge Angoran in New York and his clerk who Trump went after have received lots of death threats. The judge in Georgia, before he issued his order about recusing Fonnie Willis, he actually had to delay entry of that order several days because he was getting a security system put in his home because he knew when he denied the recusal of Fonnie Willis, he would get threats, if not actual attacks, and wanted to have a security system in his home before he did that. We've seen swatting across the country. You know what this is, where someone 
calls and says there's a you know homicidal gunman barricaded in this home and here's the address and it turns out it's just the home of a public official i mean jack smith has gotten that uh, judge T tanya chutkin in washington has gotten that the main secretary of state has gotten that treatment and so all of that is political violence and it's incredibly dangerous and so when people say these things and stoke this outrage and this anger people will hear it as a call to action i mean the ultimate example of course is january 6th where people decided they didn't like the outcome of the election, they thought it was unfair. And so they were gonna take the law into their own hands and physically through brute force prevent Congress from certifying that election. I mean, that's vigilante violence. And I mean, think about what that means if taken to its, uh, to, to its extreme. It means whoever's the biggest and strongest is gonna get their way in the society. I don't like my chances in that world. <laughs> But whether you're powerful physically or financially or politically, those are the people who have the power. And then just briefly on the, the topic of national security, um, our country has made as its foreign policy since World War II, lifting up democracies around the world. And democracy building has been part of what we do because we believe that other democracies actually make us safer here in the United States. More democracies around the world mean fewer wars, they mean fewer refugee crises, they mean better trade partners for the United States. It's why we're part of NATO, it's why we support Ukraine and all these other countries. And after January 6th, we have seen a lot of democratic backsliding. And part of it is because leaders around the world point to us and say, the United States is no longer a model of democracy. I mean, look at them. A Russian official said, American democracy is limping on both feet. See, this is evidence that democracy doesn't work. In fact, in uh, China, they say there are better forms of government than democracy because uh, democracy isn't the end game. Prosperity is the end game. And with a strong leader, you can have more prosperity than you can with these free speech rights and these rights to protest. That's not where it's at. It's all about a strong leader and prosperity. So that is harmful to the national security interests of the United States when we see democratic backsliding around the world because we are no longer the beacon of democracy. So is that leading into an erosion of law or is that just an extension of the erosion of law? I, I think it's a little bit of both, but I, you know, the rule of law is what unites us as a country. Um, we, you know, we say we are a nation of laws, not of men. No offense to the ladies, but uh, you know what I mean? It isn't that the person with the power gets to decide the issue. It is that we all agree on a certain set of laws and we are all gonna follow those laws. Um, when we see someone you know, like Donald Trump complain that the FBI has searched his home, you know, keep in mind that a, a judge looked at an application that demonstrated probable cause to believe evidence of a crime would be there and that it should be seized because it included you know, secrets of our nation, national security matters, documents that belong to the National Archives. Um, and yet, you know, Donald Trump accused them of planting evidence, said this was outrageous. All they had to do is ask me. All they had to do was ask and I would have given them back. You know, 18 months of demands notwithstanding. Um, and so is it any surprise that the next day a man posted on social media his, uh, we, let, let's all, fulfill our patriotic duty by fighting back against the FBI, went to an FBI field office in Cincinnati with an assault weapon, tried to you know, break in there. He was chased away and killed in a standoff with police later that day because um, there, is, there is this idea that if you don't like the law, we should take the law into our own hands. It's what's motivated some mass shootings. I mean, mass shootings in Buffalo, Tree of Life in Pittsburgh, and... Um, uh, Walmart in El Paso were all based on this idea that, um, you know, the great replacement, that other people are coming to replace the white people. In Buffalo, it was black people. In Pittsburgh, it was Jewish people. In El Paso, it was um, uh, Hispanics coming across the border. And we have to take the law into our own hands to protect, you know, the white Christian nationalism view of America. Um, and that's a really dangerous thing that people are being, you know, ramped up to do that. I mean, we've got to, you know, we may disagree vigorously with outcomes of court cases, 
Uh, but that's the system we have, and those are the institutions that safeguard us as a society. And so all of this talk about undermining our institutions really concerns me, and I think is sparking the political violence that we are seeing. Um, you know, it's very difficult to get people to serve in jobs these days as election officials or school board officials or county health officials because they get so much vitriol sp uh, spun back at them. And why is that? It's because there are people out there, you know, ramping them up with false claims that COVID is a hoax or that uh, books in school are trying to turn your kids gay or groom them for pedophilia, right? I mean, it is all of this disinformation that is um, creating all of this anger and violence. So what are some solutions that you would suggest that could address, address this issue? Yeah, all right, so so far it's been pretty bleak, right? I realize that, I'm sorry. <laughs> let's, let's get a little happier. Um, I am pleased to say that the longest chapter in my book is the book about proposed solutions. And so there is hope. There, there are a lot of things we can do. Um, I won't bore you with all of them, but, um, I would put them into kind of two main categories. They're sort of solving disinformation from the supply side, and then maybe solving disinformation from the um, demand side. So from the supply side, I think there is a lot that we can do to regulate social media that does not touch content. And it's when you start telling people about content that you begin to have concerns about the First Amendment, you know, telling people what they can and cannot say. But there are a lot of things that we could do about process that would not address content that I think would be perfectly compliant with the First Amendment. For example, one of the things that we have learned in recent years about how these social media platforms work is uh, through a whistleblower who used to work at Facebook named Frances Haugen. She was a whistleblower, she used to be a data scientist and she just couldn't take it anymore. And so she first uh, shared a lot of information with a Wall Street Journal reporter and then she testified before Congress. And her big message there was, it's not the content, it's the algorithms, stupid. And I'm sort of paraphrasing another former president, right? It's the economy, stupid. It's the algorithms. And the algorithms are computer programs, right? They're code that sort of decide what we see in our social media feed. And so certain things are given higher priority and other things are given lower priority that bump up to the top of our feed. And what she said is, Facebook had programmed the algorithms so that the things that would pop up to the top of people's feed was that which would engender outrage. Because the more outrage we were, the longer we'd stay online because I gotta send that out. I gotta tell all my friends, can you believe this guy? I gotta, I'll tell him off. You know what you are, I'm gonna tell him. Um, and the longer I stay on and I send that around to my friends and they're staying on and they're sending it around to their friends, um, the better data they have to show their advertisers. Look at the engagement we have. People are staying on the platform for 30 minutes at a time. You should pay more for advertisements. So it, it was good for business to generate outrage online. What we, if, even if we can't regulate content, we most certainly can regulate these algorithms and tell them either they can't you know, program to deliberately manipulate us, or at the very least disclose these algorithms and provide some transparency so that we know when we're being manipulated. So I think one is um, regulating the algorithms. I think another is regulating these bots. You know, these, these are these artificial created, artificial intelligence created accounts that kind of look like a real person. Um, you know, they might be called Cowboy Ken, and they look pretty good and they've got a picture there and everything, but Cowboy Ken is programmed to argue with you. If you use the word mega in a derogatory way, they'll say, I'm not mega, you're mega. You know, in the most uh, juvenile arguments you can ever imagine, we'll engage in arguments with people. It's like those chat bots. You ever use those things at a shopping site or at a bank or something? You know, hi, I'm, and they always have some clever sales name, you know, like, um, I don't know if it's for Lululemon, like I'm Lulu, what do you need? You know, and you say, I'd like to exchange this item. Sorry, that didn't compute. Did you say you wanna buy more items? No, I, can I talk to a human? You know, humans are great. Did you say you wanna buy more merchandise? No, um, but they also like and share the programmer's content. And so it makes it look like 
some message that nobody else has even noticed got a million likes and a million views. And now that's going to the top of everybody's feed. You know, this one that is falsely accusing some, you know, a political leader in the United States of something or spewing false information about Ukraine or um, Taylor Swift or whatever it is. But Princess Kate, she got a lot of disinformation in recent months as well. Um, so I think we can eliminate bots. There's no reason we can't, they, they have to be on there. Um, that they just sweep them out, like get rid of them. You can't have them online. I think that's one. I also think we could regulate the way they scrape our personal data and sell it to the highest bidder. Um, when I go online, I see the greatest content. A lot of it is about the Detroit Tigers of the 1980s. You know, like Lou Whitaker, Alan Trammell, 1984. Remember the 1984 World Series? Oh, yes, I do. I do. I love it. They know me, they know me better than I know myself because they're scraping my data, right? They know what I like, they know what I share, they know what I search for. And, you know, sports of my youth, I am all over that. Um, but they're also selling it to advertisers and they're selling it to political operatives and political consultants who use this. You may remember there was a big scandal, um, it was after the 2016 election, probably 2017, 2018 in there, when Cambridge Analytica was outed. This was a company founded by Steve Bannon um, that was scraping data from Facebook. And they said with 17 data points about us, they could predict with something like 94% certainty who we would vote for in the upcoming election. It was really amazing how much they know about us. And then they would share that information with pollsters or, um, Russian intelligence operatives named Konstantin Kalimnik. Uh, so they knew who to target in uh, with, their, with their fake ads and other kinds of things. So it's, it's a manipulation campaign. And so why couldn't we say to these companies, you can't scrape people's data or that if you're going to, you have to give them better disclosures than those six point font terms of service that we all just click and say, yeah, sure, whatever, sign me up. Um, so that, that data, you know, I, I tell my own kids, if you don't know what the product is, the product is you. Uh, you are, you are they, they, they want that data from you because it's valuable. So I think those are some things we can do from the um, uh, supply side. Uh, I also think there's some things that we can do from the demand side. I think that we could um, do a better job teaching our children about media literacy. Um, you know, and information literacy, so that when we see things online, we are less likely to be susceptible to it and believe it. Maybe when you see something about Patrick Mahomes, you ought to look for a second source. I'm just saying, <laughs> hypothetically, maybe before you pass it on, you ought to look for a second source. Um, in Finland, they have done a lot of good work with um, uh, information uh, literacy because they are neighbors with Russia and have been receiving disinformation from them for decades, and they've introduced it in their schools. And you know, it's fairly simple stuff. We could mm -hmm. also do um, education, I think, for our adults through civic organizations, through you know, lifelong learning programs, through faith communities, other kinds of things. But you know, some basic things like, don't always believe the headline, you should actually read the story. Have you observed this? Like the headline often bears zero resemblance to the story, right? The story is about something rather dull and the headline is the most sensational thing you can imagine. So th that's one, looking for a second source. If you've got um, you know, a, a research uh, study, looking at the sample size, right? Was it um, you know, 20,000 people uh, in the sample size or was it two, right? That makes a big difference, um, the size of the sample. The difference between causation and correlation you know, sometimes you see uh, this thing happened and then there was this result. So must, must have been a causation when in fact it's not a causation whatsoever. So I think there are things we can do there. I also think we really need to recommit ourselves to civics education. Um, I don't know about you, but when I was in school, I took courses in civics. We had to to graduate. I, um, I have read that today in the United States, we spend five cents on public education for civics for every $50 we spend on STEM education. Now, STEM education is important. 
And it probably costs more because you need equipment for STEM education. But five cents, come on. Because I think that if you have a, a deep understanding of the separation of powers and checks and balances, you are less likely to be led astray by some of these wild claims, like a president is immune from criminal prosecution, right? I mean, anybody who studied civics know like that kind of violates that idea of checks and balances. Didn't you watch Schoolhouse Rock on Saturday morning? Come on. Um, so I think there are ways we can do that. And maybe, you know, I'm a big believer in meeting people where they are. In my generation, we did watch Saturday morning cartoons and saw Schoolhouse Rock, and I learned all of those things from that. You know, maybe now it's got to be on Instagram or on TikTok or whatever it is, whatever the kids are watching, but a way to reach them um, to help build understanding so we're less influenced by uh, disinformation online. Absolutely. I love that. Um... So what can we do as individuals then to combat this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that um, we all have to commit ourselves to truth. One of uh, the things I think that is so disturbing about this moment is not only are there people who are falling for disinformation, I think there are plenty of people out there who aren't falling for it at all. They're simply going along with it because it advances their agenda. You know, Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz, Ivy League educated lawyers, they didn't believe for a minute that the election was stolen. And yet they voted against certification. And the reason they gave is like, well, some of our voters believe that there was fraud. And so we ought to honor that by at least delaying things and having some sort of inquiry. And they, they didn't believe it for a minute. I mean, Sean Hannity, all these people at Fox, they didn't believe it for a minute. Uh, in their lawsuit uh, def for defamation with Dominion uh, voting systems, it came out that they advanced all of these fraud claims on air and none of them believed it for a minute. And so for profit reasons, for political reasons, for career reasons, we see people going along with the con. And so my ask for all of you is uh, you got to stand up for truth. Even if it sometimes goes against your own personal best interest, if your party, uh, if your candidate says something that's not true, you gotta acknowledge it. You gotta call it out. Uh, because I think we are seeing too much um, in society today uh, with this either or fallacy that we care more about being on the red team or the blue team than about the kind of real compromise it takes to advance as a society. We got a lot of work to do, right? We've got climate change. We've got um, immigration challenges to be sure. Um, we've got all kinds of important problems to solve, and we can't do that unless we agree on facts and we make compromises in our policies. And so I think the most important thing all of us can do is to make sure we're choosing uh, truth over our political tribe. That's excellent. So I thought I would just close with one more question or commentary in terms of um, a, a passage in your book that we already talked about briefly beforehand in terms of you also say that the solution, I believe, lies in an appeal to patriotism, our shared love of country and commitment to its endurance. And where, where that comes in, the patriotism piece of things, and do we all see ourselves as patriots or are we misreading the definition of that. No, I, I think this, you know, this commitment to truth is the true definition of being a patriot and caring enough about our country to reflect critically on our, our good attributes and our flaws and trying to make our country better for everybody. I think that disinformers have appropriated the symbols of patriotism in a very superficial way. You know. You can wear a flag pin on your lapel and that doesn't make you a patriot. What makes you a patriot is a commitment to the truth, working together, trying to find unity and common ground with people instead of trying to sow division. I mean, I think that is the true definition of patriotism. That's what it means to love America. America was founded as a country that respected um, equality and freedom. You know, certainly we had our flaws in our founding documents and we've continued to try to move toward a more perfect union. We're not there yet, but that's the goal. And these efforts to divide us, I think are 
temporary power grabs. I think true patriotism means working together to build our country toward a better future. Thank you for that. I'm going to actually move into audience questions now. Um, from Zoom, we had a question. With this vast and ever-changing landscape, did you have to go back and edit or rewrite any portion of your book with a oh, new- so many times. <laughs> yeah, that's such a good question. Um, constantly chasing the news cycle. So I would submit a draft and then I kept- um, one of the ways I work is I just I keep a lot of notes on my phone. And so I'd have book updates. And then, you know, like some story would come out like, oh, I got to put that in the book. Uh, you know, put the, I got to put that in the book. Gotta put, so I did a lot of the examples that I had in the book. Originally, I removed and replaced with more updated examples. So I turned in a first draft of this in February of 2022. No, 23, February 2023. And then another draft in the summer, massive updates. And then my last draft was in September of 23. Um, and so even then I lived in fear that something massive would happen because it didn't come out until it's a long time from September of 23 till February. Um, but uh, they did indulge the ability to make some changes very late in the game because the, the, the news cycle just moved so fast. And the examples, I mean, there are just more examples than you could possibly include, but I wanted to include the most salient and some of the more recent ones in the book. Great. Um, now I'm kind of curious which ones you replaced. Though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so another question from Zoom. In your opinion, what is the worst, most likely thing to happen this November? Well, I don't know if worst and most likely are the same things, right? They might be two different things. I think the worst thing that could happen is um, information, d disinformation that confuses voters and actually causes people to waste their vote. I am very worried about that. Um, we know that Russia is already doing that. China got involved in the elections in Taiwan. Um, voter suppression and you know, choosing groups that are likely Democratic voters and sending them messages about uh, you know, false information about voting. One of the things that actually is tricky is in many states, the election laws have changed in recent years. So just learning what the law is in your state could matter. You know, in Michigan, you can register on the same day now, but imagine something that comes out that says, if you haven't been registered for two weeks, you know, seven days before the election, it's too late for you. That's false, but I could imagine people seeing that and believing it to be true. And because of the ability to micro-target us, you know, again, like Detroit Tigers fan from the 1980s, we all have our version of that. Because of this ability to micro-target people, you could say, I'm gonna choose groups that I think are likely Democratic voters or whatever your party, your rival party is. I'm gonna send it to that small group. And if the group is small enough, there's not enough visibility from outside groups to rebut it. And so it may even be unknown, you know, like we might not have the, the ability to see all of the messages that are being, it might be very tailored to different groups. So I worry, or, you know, what if you get a message like this on election day, you get a robocall that says, you know, I'm calling from your polling place at, you know, for me, Angel Elementary School, where the power is out and we're holding the election tomorrow. Right. I mean, most people won't believe that, but what if even a handful do, right? You could have something like that. Or, you know, there's been some catastrophe and the election's been postponed till till next week. Um, in 2016, there was an effort targeting African American voters in particular that said, Did you know that this year you can vote by text? Uh, enjoy the convenience of voting from home by voting by text. And hundreds of people sent in their vote uh, by text. You know, you can vote for Hillary Clinton by voting, you know, this number and Donald Trump that number. And again, you know, how many of those people wasted their vote because it looked, it looked good, like it looked genuine. So that's my biggest fear. What I think will really happen is wise people will rise up and defend America. I, I do think it's really important for all of us to have accurate information about voting. I know our outstanding Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson, is making this a real priority. She's calling it pre-bunking and making sure that she's getting out to groups 
with pamphlets, website, with accurate information about voting. And so, you know, one of the things we all can do is arm ourselves with that information so that we know where we can find reliable information. The other source I always send people to are the League of Women Voters. Any League of Women Voters people here? Thank you. Um, great materials as well, you know, accurate, nonpartisan, just information about how to vote. So I have confidence in everyone in this room to safeguard our, that's what I think is gonna happen. Great, great. <laughs> All right. Um, we have a question here saying disinformation has been a tactic for decades. Why has it overwhelmed presidential and congressional elections since 2020, 2010? I think there are two reasons that we have seen so much disinformation in recent years. One is social media, as we've talked about. It has grown unchecked. Um, and since 1996, there's something called the uh, Communications Decency Act of 1996, Section 230, that gives immunity to social media platforms for any legal liability. And so that really makes it difficult to regulate. It really allows them to push anything there, kind of anything that goes, including false claims. And uh, I think that is one reason we have seen so much of this. Um, and, you know, in 1996, the internet was in its infancy. If, um, if, if has anybody read the Communications Decency Act of, 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 of 1996? It reads like a children's fairy tale. Like <laughs> the internet is a wonderful opportunity to connect people from around the world. You can almost hear the birds chirping, you know, and the music <laughs> playing. It's so lovely. Um, and that may have been true. And it is, I mean, it's a wonderful thing. As we said, there are people connecting you know, by Zoom tonight, you can connect with people all over the world and it is a wonderful thing. But it's changed and it's grown and it's gotten a little bit out of control. It's like um, raising a baby alligator in your bathtub. It's adorable when it first, you know, it's first born and small, but someday it grows into a man-eating predator and you can't treat it the same way you did when it was a baby alligator as when it's, when it's a man-eating predator. And I think that's the stage that we've reached with social media, it's a man-eating predator. So I think that's one reason we see all this disinformation now relating to elections. I think the other reason though is this, um, this is an insight I got from reading a book by Ezra Klein called Why We're So Polarized. I don't know if anybody's read that book, great book. But one of the things he talks about is starting in the mid 1990s, Karl Rove developed a strategy that George W. Bush used and now Democrats also use, which is instead of as they had traditionally done working to court the middle, um, the persuadable swing voters. Instead, what they decided to do and what has been more effective is to double down on your reliable voters, to pander to the base and to get the base really excited about turnout. Because if they turn out, they're a reliable vote for you. You know, these swing voters, I don't know how they're gonna go, but these people over here, they're gonna vote for me if they show up. So what do I need to do? I need to motivate them to show up. And the way I motivate them to show up is I convince them that this is an existential election. This time, the rival is so bad. And here are the issues. And I push all those emotional, hot button cultural issues. Instead of talking about you know, tax policy and kitchen table issues, I'm gonna talk about these cultural issues that get people really excited. And both parties have engaged in that. And so I don't like to both sides too much. And I won't mostly, but I think when it comes to this polarization idea, this is something both parties have done. And so I think that is why we see all of this disinformation uh, in our elections. Okay. I mean, that's really interesting in terms of, you know, I, I was not even aware of that. So um, we got a late question, but here, here we go. How can, can a single individual help with civics education and what organizations can help with that? Yeah, well, I don't know. I would love to hear from anybody in the audience whose thoughts about that. I mean, certainly our school boards, um, our state board of education, I think is a place where we need to convince um, people that civics education should be an essential part of, of uh, the high school curriculum. I suppose there are things we can do um, with, uh, you know, at an individual level with the people in our lives. But, uh, but other than that, I think it's the kind of thing that requires a governmental solution 
when it comes to, uh, to teaching. Um, I suppose in our schools, you know, the problem is, I don't know if we have any teachers or retired teachers in the audience. So uh, thank you. So uh, thank you, teachers. Teachers are the best. Um, you know, teachers are so overwhelmed with all the things they have to do, including teaching to all these standardized tests that they say, we don't have any extra space in the curriculum for it. But I think civics is so critically important that we've got to find space for that. So uh, I guess I would say, the I don't know that this is something the ordinary person can do other than lobbying your lawmakers, your state reps, um, your school boards for civics education and explaining the importance of it. Absolutely, and I'll just put a plug in for the National Archives and Records Administration. We do a lot with civics education. This program would be considered part of civics education for us. So, you know, there's, there's lots of programs across all 40 facilities that we have. Absolutely encourage you all to, to uh, see what's out there from the National Archives. Um, all right, one, I think this might be our last question. I, I'm saving a, a fun one for the very end though. Um, do you have any optimism that these trends are going to ease or even reverse? Um, yes, uh, <laughs> any optimism. So um, like anything in democracy, it's not gonna happen by itself. If we just sit back and watch, I think it's only going to get worse because um, there are people who want to make it worse. There are people who see advantage in um, disinformation to gain power, to advance their own careers, to make profits. And so I think if we sit back and do nothing, it will get worse. But um, we don't have to sit back and do nothing. You know, one of the things that most inspires me about change agents, um, there's certainly been all kinds of change movements throughout history, but the one that really gets me is the mothers against drunk driving. Oh man, don't mess with the mothers, right? <laughs> um, mothers got mad. You know, there was a time, I can remember when I was a young person and people would say, eh, what are you gonna do? You know, guy goes to the bar, has a few too many and eh, you know, things happen beyond his control. And like, no, this is not acceptable. We refuse to accept this. And the culture absolutely changed around drinking and driving. And I think we can do the same thing with lies. I mean, integrity matters, truth matters in our society. And now I see so often, you know, some of the, the nasty grams I get is, oh, what's truth anyway? Is there really any truth? What are you, the truth police? Like, you bet there's truth. And this is, this is a strategy, an effort to undermine the very concept of truth. In Putin's Russia, this is how it is done. Everything's PR, everything's spin, your vote doesn't matter anyway. And so people get cynical and then they disengage from politics altogether because what am I going to do? They're all, they're all liars. Every one of them's a liar. Well, let's demand better, right? We have the power to do that. We have the power to organize and we have the power to vote. And so I am optimistic because I believe in the power of democracy that we all have the ability to change our destinies. And I'm, I'm counting on all of you to do that. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I do, I do have one quick question here. Somebody would like to know what your favorite hot dog is in Ann Arbor. Oh, favorite hot dog. You must be a sisters-in-law listener. We've been in a big debate on who's got the best hot dog, Coney, Detroit Coney's or Chicago dogs, which are good. You know what I always liked was raised Red Hots. It used to be called Red Hot Lovers and they've closed, right? Or at least they're out of, they're, they're, they look like they're, temporarily permanent. I walk by there from time to time to see if they got a, I can pick up a raised dog and they've been closed. So I don't know who's got the, the dog used to be good. They closed. Yeah. Who's got a best hot dog in Ann Arbor? I don't know who's got the best. Any suggestions? Yeah. Any good ones mm -hmm. up there these days? Well, I do enjoy a good number 73 from Zingerman's if anyone's <laughs> buying. <laughs> The Tarb's Tenacious Tenure, Chef's Kiss. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Barbara McQuaid, for coming out tonight. This has been terrific. Thank you all, too, for, your, for coming and visiting. And I do have a, a little gift here from the, the Ford Library Museum for your participation this evening. And Barbara McQuaid is going to be out in our lobby signing books.
Um, so, and we have them for sale too. If you don't have a copy yet, please, you can get one out in the lobby as well. There you go. <laughs> All right, well, thank you again so much. It's been terrific. that way too